The Lord be with you. Pat, if you want to teach us some more songs like that, go right ahead. I like that one. That was a good one. And, uh, in fact, I'm encouraging you to do that more. Uh, if you would join with me in turning in your copy of Holy Scripture to Matthew chapter 3, you'll see there the title of this morning's sermon is Fulfill All Righteousness. What? And as I was reading that, I started to think about one of Cole's most favorite things to say now. I'll say something to him, and he, something new, and he'll look at me and go, Huh? What's that mean? But I couldn't find a way to write that down as a title for a sermon, so I just decided to use the word what. So Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17 is where it will be this morning. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we are in this place now, help us, Lord, to have ears to hear your words, while whatever words I may place in the way are quickly forgotten. Help us to hear your words calling us to be your people, calling us to do your will, to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Speak to us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, he woke up that morning as he had done for some time now. He had likely spent the night before on some hard, flat surface, maybe nothing to hold his head up but a rock. He got dressed in what had become sort of a uniform if he hadn't slept in it overnight. His trademark camel's hair shorts, his leather belt, and he walked into the world picking bits of locust out of his teeth and trying to scrub the crystallized honey out of his beard. He was going down to the river, down to the Jordan, to take his usual place there in the water. No pulpit, just the water. To preach his usual message of repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. It was his usual routine, but it was not a usual day. For as he left for the river, John noticed on his calendar that that day his cousin was coming to the river. That meant things, things were about to get a little spicy. Things were about to get real. You see, he had grown up his entire life hearing about his cousin, spending time with his cousin. Hearing about how God was really his father, how an angel had told his Aunt Mary that she was pregnant with his cousin, how angels, how angels were there to sing him happy birthday on the day that he was born. Now, John himself had been born under some pretty spectacular circumstances. His father was a priest in the temple, his mother and father both, uh, uh, let's say, on in years, surprised to learn that she was pregnant, Elizabeth was, with John. But Jesus, his cousin, his birth was on a different level. And I think John understood that to some degree. In fact, most scholars agree Jesus had likely been a disciple of John's, following John around in the desert, listening to his message of repentance and forgiveness, of life change, of reorienting oneself to the way of God. And no doubt, John had come to see in his cousin Jesus all that he had been told about him. So on that day, as John was heading down to the river, knowing that Jesus was coming too, perhaps John mulled over in his mind what was going to be different about that day. How he would introduce Jesus to the crowd, 
into the world. And there was a crowd. Matthew tells us there was a crowd, a crowd of all sorts. In verse 5, just before our text this morning, Matthew says the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to John and all the region along the Jordan. A crowd. From everywhere. A crowd would be good. You want a crowd when you're going to introduce somebody. You want a crowd when you, when you feel like this person you're going to bring into the world and introduce to everyone is going to be a big deal. You want a lot of folks there. You'll call it off if only three show up. You'll make sure you do a little more hype. There was a crowd. And if John is going to introduce Jesus, he wants a crowd. And this crowd would have been just right. They had come to the Jordan to hear John. Now, I don't know why all of them came. Maybe some of them came to hear his message. Maybe they were moved by what they had heard about the wild-haired preacher out in the Jordan. Maybe they wanted to see the spectacle. I can imagine, I can imagine if next week I showed up in the pulpit and clown makeup and a rainbow wig, the next Sunday some folks might show up to see what's going on. I heard the fat one down at Williams is wearing a wig. Let's go see him. Maybe they wanted to see the spectacle. Maybe, maybe they heard that something was happening. This, this hint of spiritual fervor. One of the Essenes has come out of the desert and is standing in the Jordan and he's preaching. And I like what he has to say. Maybe, or maybe, as so many folks often do when they are oppressed, caught an inkling of John's political edge, wanted to come out and hear him. Maybe, I don't know. Whatever brought them all to the river that day, they came in droves, and John was going to make the best of it, take the opportunity. In fact, John looks out at the crowd, begins to sort of spy who's there, and he notices, he notices who's there right away. It's not just all the destitute folks. It's not the folks who were down in line at the shelter or over in line at the food pantry, and then they all came down to get a little religion at the Jordan. No, no. He looked down in the crowd, and there he saw Pharisees and Sadducees, some of the most pious and religious folk of the day. And then John decides he's going to turn up the brimstone just a little bit on them. You brood of vipers, he says. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Don't presume to say to yourself, we got Abraham as our ancestor, because I'm going to tell you right now, John says, these rocks, God can make sons of Abraham out of them. Even now, he says, with this sort of language from Isaiah, the axe is being laid at the root, and any tree that doesn't bear good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Whew. I can hear him, can't you? I mean, if you think the, the folks uh, got really on edge with Jonathan Edwards, here's John the Baptist in the creek calling him out. I mean, I can almost feel the heat coming off the page, the heat of their embarrassment and their anger. These Pharisees and Sadducees, they came, coat and tie, Bible under their arm, and here's this country preacher in a camel diaper, in a creek, can't even comb his hair, and he's calling out me? I can hear it. Now, we like to think John did that all the time. Maybe he did, but maybe he was just in rare form that day, encouraged by the knowledge that Jesus was coming down to the river. That all these folks were about to witness firsthand all that he had come to know about his divine cousin. Why he even says it in the sermon. He keeps on. He says, I baptize you with water. But the one coming after me, oh man, he's better. He's more powerful than me. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's good in church. And fire. Ooh. I'm going to baptize you with water, but he's coming with fire. I'm not even worthy to carry his shoes. He's got a winnowing fork in his hand. He's going to clear his threshing floor. And whatever don't go in the granary, he's going to burn up with unquenchable fire. That's what John said. I can hear it way on back in the crowd. Yes, sir. Preach. I can hear it way on back. Somebody getting excited. John was, as we say down here in the south, shelling down the corn, standing in there preaching. I mean, he calls out the religious folks, calls them snakes. Tells them to bear good fruits or else be burned up. And then he starts talking about somebody coming after him. A headliner to his opening act. One who will baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. I mean, come on. Do you want to be baptized with water or fire? 
What sounds more exciting, water or fire? I mean, John's building them up. John's water baptism is going to seem puny. When this other fire baptizer comes, I want to see that. John practically says so himself. He says, I can't even stoop down to untie his sandals, to carry his shoes. Can't do it. John's really hyped up Jesus' arrival. I mean, I can imagine folks down there at the Jordan, elbowing one another, expecting some real showstopper to come strolling up down the banks of the Jordan. Someone with an even more outlandish appearance than John. Someone with an obvious sense of power and authority in his cadence. Well, I can even hear some of them now whispering to one another, Hey, where's this guy John's talking about? I'd like to meet him. Is John going to go get him? I'll wait. I'll wait. Because if he is, I'd rather stick around for the main event. Let's get on over with the opening act. I want to see this guy. I suppose. It'd be like someone coming out on stage, putting on a great show, everyone applauding, everyone excited, and then him walking up to the microphone and saying, if you like that, watch this. John really built him up. He's coming with fire, winnowing fork in his hand. He's ready, going to call out folks, naming names. And then Matthew says, Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. That's it? No, no, hold on, hold on. Maybe Matthew missed a part, right? Maybe, maybe. Has your Bible got the rest of it in there? Did he come? Did he pull up in, in a Cadillac? Uh, did he show up in a limousine? Did a helicopter drop him? Did he come on a party pontoon down the Jordan? Where's Jesus? This, he just showed up? Just showed up. That's it? I mean, that's nothing. I mean, he didn't just show up. The language tells us Jesus was intentional about being at the Jordan that day. And he was intentional about being baptized by John. This wasn't an accident. Jesus didn't get up in the morning and say, I guess I'll go down and listen to Cousin John, see what he's got to say, and then stand out in the crowd and be so moved that he decided, I'm going to go down and get baptized too. No, no, that's not what happened. Jesus meant to be there. Jesus intended to be there. But come on. I mean, John, John spent six verses before our text this morning, six verses railing against religious leaders, building up Jesus as the one who would baptize not with water but with fire, who had a winnowing fork in his hand, as one who came to take names, to judge sinners and their sins, to throw some folks into hell and let others into heaven. John had built him up. Jesus, Jesus just shows up like it's no big deal. And then, then on top of that, on top of this underwhelming entrance, he does the last thing. The last thing anyone would expect this guy John had been preaching about to do. John had said, he's coming after me. He's more powerful than me. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then he walks up to John and says, I need you to baptize me in water. What in the world is going on? You know, Jesus' baptism has caused many a Christian down through the centuries to scratch their heads. Why does Jesus get baptized? I know why I believe I got baptized. That better not be why Jesus got baptized. Why did Jesus get baptized? What's the point? Did he actually have to repent of something? That doesn't line up with Christian orthodoxy. doesn't line up with the scriptures. doesn't line up with Jesus' life, so no. Was there some grand mysterious reason behind it mm -hmm. I know what it was Jesus wanted to model the proper way for baptism so we Baptists could spend generations and hundreds of years correcting all of our Catholic Episcopal Presbyterian Lutheran Methodist and all the mother baby sprinklers that's what it was he wanted to show us the right way to do it so we'd have a biblical example right no We've come up with all sorts of ideas as to why Jesus went down for baptism when he had nothing of which to repent and no need for forgiveness. It's been something we've struggled with, really, since the beginning of the church. It's why Matthew puts and lets us know this line from John that Mark does not tell us. In verse 14, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. I mean, isn't that just like Jesus, though? 
Isn't that just like Jesus? John thought he knew Jesus. I mean, he did grow up with him. He grew up with Jesus, knew about him from the time he was old enough to know anything, thought he knew what to expect when Jesus showed up, preached him up in a big way with dramatic imagery and fiery language. But when Jesus shows up and wants to be baptized, you come to me. It's understandable that John would question Jesus' actions. But again, in typical Jesus fashion, Jesus doesn't answer John's question in a clear, direct, well-outlined way. He, Jesus doesn't say, yes, I need to be baptized by you because theologically this is what this means. Christologically, no, no. Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. What does that even mean? I suppose we might think that Jesus means baptism is some piece of righteousness, some deed necessary to accomplish in order to achieve righteousness. we got to go down the list, you know, say the sinner's prayer, walk the aisle, get baptized, join a Sunday school class. we got to go down the list. But no, that misses the original intent of the word righteousness. Jesus doesn't come to John because he needs the effects of of baptism because he has some sins of which he needs to repent. No, John baptizes Jesus as an act of obedience, a part of God's inbreaking kingdom coming through the incarnate Christ. It's not exactly a cut and dry sort of answer, to be honest with you. I'm not always comfortable with it. But the point is that it doesn't really matter the why as to why Jesus came to be baptized. He came to be baptized by John. Jesus came to be baptized by his cousin John. And for John to deny him baptism would be to do the very thing many of us are guilty of doing over and over again. Refusing to accept what Jesus calls us to do because of how it makes us feel or because of what we think about it. I mean, put your place, put yourself in John's place. If John had refused to baptize Jesus, I doubt things would have turned out much different. In fact, if you read just John's gospel, Jesus never gets baptized. It's not there. It's not in John. John just talks about Jesus, never dunks him in the water. Things don't turn out much different in John's gospel. But if John had refused... It would have been because of John's own expectations of what Jesus was supposed to be, of who Jesus was supposed to be. John had preached an image of a Jesus as a powerful judge, a fiery preacher, yet Jesus came to be baptized by John himself. There's more than a bit of dissonance there. Again, though, isn't that just like Jesus? So many of us believe we have Jesus all figured out. After all, we've heard about him our whole lives, read about him our whole lives. Many of us have been involved in churches where we've worshipped him our whole lives. Some of us, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 maybe years we've spent. We think we've got him figured out. We're pretty sure we've got him pegged. We know what he'll do, what he'll do, what he expects of us. We know who Jesus likes, who he doesn't like. We know what Jesus wants, what he doesn't want. We've got it figured out. But then something comes along. Something comes along and jars us, shakes us up a bit, causes us to question what we think we know about Jesus. Maybe we lose a job. How's that happen? I've been faithful. I haven't done anything wrong. Why, why me? Why? We get a surprise, devastating diagnosis. I hadn't done a thing wrong. I watch what I eat. I exercise every day. I do the right thing. How do you mean, what do you mean stage four? It doesn't make sense. Go through a divorce. Wife comes in, the paper's in the envelope, sits them on the table. I need them signed by Friday. What happened? What happened? Where, where's God? A son comes to her. Dad, I've been been meaning to tell you for a long time I'm gay what do we do it shakes up everything we hear a sermon 
that challenges us. You know, I don't like that new preacher. It's getting under my skin. We meet someone who causes us to question everything we think we know about ourselves. We lose a loved one unexpectedly. Something shakes the comfortable ground beneath our feet. And whatever certainty we had about Jesus all of a sudden becomes less certain. And how we respond to Jesus in those times says everything about the kind of faith we have in Jesus. You see, John could have refused. He could have. I think maybe he would have been in the right. He could have refused to baptize Jesus. He could have insisted about it. No, 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 Jesus. I've known you my whole life. I just told these folks I'm not fit to carry your shoes. I know you're coming with the judgment of fire. I know what you're doing. I'm not fit to even baptize you. I think you've got it wrong. You need to talk to your dad again. I think you've got it messed up. There's no way. No way I'm going to baptize you. It doesn't make any sense. John could have protested, claiming he believed. Jesus, you're too good. You're too good to be baptized by me. You're too holy, too perfect to be baptized by me, too righteous. You don't need this baptism. These sinners need this baptism, not you. He could have refused but he would have been out of step with God's purpose. In the same way, we sometimes argue with Jesus when we're confronted by him, when we're made uncomfortable by the reality of Christ's power, his grace, his mercy, his love. We can argue. We can argue with chapter and verse, cite tradition, claim we know Jesus. We know Jesus better than that. We know Jesus to be better than whatever this is in front of us. And we can argue. The more we push against Christ, the more we claim to know better, the more we simply refuse to acknowledge that maybe the things that shake us, that make us uncomfortable, the realities that cause us to question the more we refuse that they may in fact come from Jesus himself, the more out of line we may become with God's kingdom purpose for our lives. See, even though John may have imagined Jesus' arrival at the Jordan differently, even though he may have initially protested baptizing Jesus, John demonstrates his faith in Christ by consenting, by following through, with Jesus' baptism, even given the mysterious reason from Jesus himself. John demonstrates his faith in the one he's heard about from birth, the one he grew up with, the one who he was absolutely sure he knew as well as anyone. And he demonstrates that faith in the wake of shaken convictions and challenged assumptions. And so I want to ask you, is that the kind of faith you have? Is your faith in Christ one that can withstand having your assumptions shattered? Is your faith in Christ one of obedience, even to those things which you think might be below you, or even below Christ himself? Or is your faith one that requires certainty, the type of faith that needs final answers and for your imagined images of God to be real, or else it all starts to unravel? When our faith is built upon required certainties and those certainties are shaken or shattered altogether, our faith is shaken or shattered altogether. For it is a faith made not in God's image, but in our own. But when our faith is truly placed in Christ, A Christ who challenges everything. A Christ who calls us beyond ourselves, whose place is so often with those who we deem to be other. When our certainties are tested, our absolutes are shaken, our faith remains. For Jesus remains. Christ always remains. When our certainties, our convictions When all of those things we think and hold to be true fall away, Christ always remains. And he always calls us to a life of obedience.
to fulfill all righteousness. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to place our faith in you, to trust you. God, even when our lives are shaken, even when the things we hold to be certain and true seem to come apart, God, help us to place our faith and trust in you, for you always, God, always call us to your greater purpose. For we know, as the scripture tells us, all things, Lord, all things work together for the good of those who love and trust you. So Holy Spirit, speak to us. Show us those places in our lives, those certainties that we have perhaps formed even into idols. Convict us, Lord. Help us to repent, to turn to you, and to trust that whatever may come, certain or not, that you remain and call us ever on in this journey of faith. So be with us, Holy Spirit, we pray now in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.